Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. In 2 Corinthians 9, verse 1, it says, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. Lord, thank you for uh, this night. Thank you that we can be here tonight. And uh, Lord, bless. Thank you for what we've sung about, just the blessing the songs have been. And um, Lord, um, help us again tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. You see an unusual word there. You don't hear it much anymore. Um, and it's the word superfluous. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write unto you. And then it's in verse 2, he says, For I know the forwardness of your mind, which I boast of you to them of Macedonia and Achaia, was your, boy, verse 2, for which I boast of them, boy, oh boy, let me try that again. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Some of you are familiar with these uh, uh, these chapters here in the middle of 2 Corinthians, and they're really about an offering that was to be given. And uh, Paul is writing to the Corinthians. He's telling them to get it ready. But in verse 1, he says something interesting. He says, when it comes to being a blessing to the saints, he says to the Corinthians, it is superfluous for me to write unto you. Superfluous means unnecessary. It means it when something is superfluous, it's so abundant, it's so over and above that it is very unnecessary. It was not necessary to write to them about this. Paul is writing to them about this offering that he he wants to bring to the poor saints at Jerusalem. And uh, they were um, they were on board. Other groups had already preceded them. And, um, and he says, you guys already have this down. It was not necessary for him to write this. Yet the Holy Ghost said to write it anyway. It wasn't because they were about to fail. It was actually because they were doing very well. You know, God's ways are not our ways. And God wrote a message to the folks who did not need it. You know, this should be our aim. To be the folks who don't need it. Not the folks who think they don't need it. And there's lots of those. You know, they have need of nothing. And yet... They don't realize they're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That's Laodicea. And it's funny how a lot of folks in the Laodicean church age would pride themselves at not being like Corinth. And yet Corinth had this down. They didn't need to be reminded about this. God writes to the folks who don't need it. He did it to encourage them. He did it to keep the truth ever in front of them. He did it because living the truth had brought them where they are. And you never come to the place where God does not have a message for you. It's these people that don't need the reminder that are going to keep responding. Did you ever notice that often it is the best folks that keep responding to God? I remember many years ago, I was a teenager and I was in uh, the church that we attended in those years. And it was a fairly large church. They probably ran 300 on Sunday morning. And um, it was a, it was a Sunday evening service. And uh, the pastor preached a message on being a witness at the end of the message. He gave the invitation, which in, in those churches, 
Uh, they always did that, and they would encourage people to come forward all the time. And um, he gives the invitation. He's just preached on witnessing. And a guy named Willie McAllister was one of the few that went forward. Now, Willie at that time was about 60 years old. And um, Willie was a great guy. Willie was one of the most gentle guys you'd ever meet. Willie was about six foot three, six foot four. And um, the pastor preaches on witnessing and Willie comes forward. And I will never forget it. There's Willie at the altar. And the pastor just shakes his head and said, it never fails. Here's Willie. And he's a faithful witness. He's always witnessing. And he's the one at the altar. The message was superfluous for Willie. But he's the one that responded. You know, the folks that don't need it, the ones that are on the ball, they, they don't need the reminder. And yet the Holy Ghost writes to them. Look at Luke 19. Luke 19. I'm sure sometimes, you know, you'll be at a church service somewhere and and um, you'll hear the preacher open the Bible and you'll think, oh, I know what he's going to preach on. And um, and you might be thinking, oh, I don't need that one. And yet. And you don't you might not need it. You know, not every message is aimed at failures. You know, we always think, oh, God's going to, this guy's going to get up and he's going to rip our face off. Well, I mean, he does that sometimes, but, but, but you know what? Sometimes God knows you don't need it. And you think the message is not for me, but oh, no, 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 no. You don't need it. And so the message is for you. Luke 19, verse 15. Now you'll recognize the account, but I want you to notice something as we read. Luke 19, Verse 15, and it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said, likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. And another came saying, Lord, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou laidst not down and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? And he said unto them, Now this is what you want to see. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath 10 pounds. And what did the servant say in verse 25? And they said unto him, Lord, he hath 10 pounds. You know what the Lord said? He said, take that pound and give it to the guy that doesn't need it. Look at verse 26. For I say unto you that unto every one which hath shall be given. And from him that hath not, even that he hath, shall be taken from him. Look at Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Verse 
Matthew 13, a very similar verse, just a little different wording, but he sort of emphasizes something. Matthew 13, verse 12. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. The Holy Ghost writes to Corinth and he says, you don't need this. So I'm going to write to you. The strange thought. You know, pastors and evangelists, they preach to get people to move towards God, to drop their sin, to start doing the right thing, to stop doing the wrong things. But if they're not careful, they will focus in the wrong place as a pastor, as an evangelist. They focus in the wrong place and they get frustrated by all the people who don't budge, who never seem to move an inch. Because isn't that what it's all about? I mean, here, here you are. You're witnessing to somebody at work, and man, they're a mess. And you, 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 you try to reach them, and and um, you know, you witness to a relative. They're getting older. They got one foot in the grave. They got a terminal illness, and you witness to them, and they don't move. And years ago, a preacher somewhere was preaching, and he was trying to get a bunch of Christian folks. To quit loving the world. And one day it dawned on him. That he wasn't going to change the worldly folks mind. But he was greatly encouraging those who had already turned away from the world. Did the ones that had turned away from the world. Did they need to be convinced of the evil of the world? No. No. It was superfluous. So the Holy Ghost said, preach it for them. They've already got it, but they will be given more. Yes, God wants to help his people grow. And yes, God wants to perfect and complete his people. And we are a needy bunch. You know, in 2 Peter 1, um, we are told to add all sorts of things to our faith. But even when a place of completeness is reached, and that is possible, there is such a thing as being a mature Christian. Um, John writes to them in 1 John 2, and he calls them fathers. Even when a place of completeness is reached, God has more to say and more to give and God wants us to keep the ground that we have gained. When you reach the place where you don't need it, you probably won't know it. Look at a few verses with me. Look at Philippians 3. You know, you, you will be conscious of, you know, man, I've grown. Man, things that used to bother me don't bother me anymore. Uh, man, you know, the Lord's brought me a long way from where I started. You you will be aware. It's not wrong to acknowledge those things. And man, you ought to praise the Lord for those things. Um, and yet there's a sense when, you know, if you really do reach a really good place, you probably won't know it. <laughs> Look at Philippians 3, verse 12. And Paul says those famous words, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. You know, Paul was pretty far down the road. And Paul said, you know, I have not attained. Look at the book of Job, Job chapter 9. Of course, Job is right before Psalms. Look at 
Job chapter 9. Job chapter 9, verse 20. Job chapter 9, verse 20. If I justify myself, Job says, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. Now, you know, do you remember how the book started? God said there was a man in the land of o, uh, in the land of us whose name was Job. The same was a perfect man. But look what Job says here in verse 20. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. Though I were perfect, yet would I not know my soul. I would despise my life. He said, you know, even if even if I was perfect, he said I wouldn't know it. Look at 1 Timothy 1. 1 Timothy 1, verse 15, Paul says, and we, we actually quoted this verse this morning, but I want you to see the end of it. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And look what Paul says, of whom I am chief. Notice, notice he said, uh, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am was chief. That's, that's not what he said. He didn't say I was chief. He said I am chief. Look at Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3 verse 7. <coughs> Uh, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me, who am less than the least of all saints. Now, if somebody stood up tonight and I said, you know, we're going to have a word of testimony, you know, and people started standing up and Given a word of testimony, and somebody said, "You know what? I am, I am just, I am just, I'm just less than the least. I'm just at the bottom of the bottom." Now, you know, unless the dude was living in sin and we all knew it, you know, we we might say, "Wow, so and so is really sincere," but we would think, "Nah, that's a stretch." You know who says it? One of the greatest saints that ever lived. And uh, he's getting he's getting towards the end of the road here. And he says, um, I am less than the least. Look at Second Peter one. You know what I think the Lord does? I think. Um, you know, as we go along, um, it, it is a wonderful blessing if the Lord always keeps you reminded that you're nothing. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think sober. I think so. I think what the Lord does is, um, you know, the Lord lets you feel your infirmities uh, he lets you feel your weakness, which we always have. We always have that old nature. I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law warring in my mind, warring against the spirit in me. And, and you, you always feel that. And, uh, you know, it's a blessing. You read those Old Testament kings and some of them followed the Lord and they did amazing 
And the Lord blessed them and blessed them and blessed them. And sometimes it was to their demise. And that wasn't the Lord's intention. But we see the tendency of man. He reaches this place of exaltation and blessing. David was finally established. And he knew that the kingdom was his finally. Boy, it wasn't long. And he messes up with Bathsheba. He did fine when he was being hunted like a rabbit in the mountains. He did fine then. You know, it's a blessing that the Lord keeps us aware of our weaknesses. It's actually a wonderful thing. Second Peter 1, verse 12. The Holy Ghost says, wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established. He said, you, you don't you don't need, you don't need this reminder. But he said, but that's why I'm writing it. You know, there's things in the Bible you're going to read and there's messages you're going to hear and um, and. And you're doing fine. And God may let you read something. And boy, that is the value of reading your Bible from cover to cover every year. And you just keep reading it and reading it. And you meditate in it. And you see the story you've seen 30 times before or 100 times before. You know what? There's something about the way we're wired. We need that. We need that. And God may have written something that you're actually doing fine with. But today, he wants you to read it again. And it will help you keep what you already have. Look at Revelation 3. Revelation 3, verse 11. It says, Behold, the Lord says, I come quickly. Now watch. Hold that fast which thou hast. Hold on to it with a vice grip that no man take thy crown. You know, there's some of you here, and man, you've done well. And um, and you know what the danger is? The danger is that you'll lose what you've got, spiritually, spiritually. And you know what he says will do it? He says somebody will take your crown. You know, he said in Galatians, he said, um, who hath bewitched you? Not what, but who? And you know, the devil's got somebody and they're going to come along beside you and, and, or maybe you're going to, you know, maybe you're going to, you know, see something, hear something somewhere and it'll be somebody. And um, the devil uses people. The devil whispers through people. The devil jabs you through people. Um, and um, the devil wants to take what you have. And God will have you read and read and read. He'll have you here. You know, we keep coming to church. What does it, what does it say? And forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know, I, I listened to uh, preaching on, uh, I got sermon audio and, and I for sermon audio. It's, it's a little app on your phone. And there's a zillion preachers really of all kinds on there. And but, I, but there's a few guys I know, and I listen to some of them. And I've been doing a little more lately. And uh, I know that's no substitute for the Word of God. You have to be careful with that. Um, man, it's, it's no substitute for the Word of God. But, you know, I listen to some of those messages, and I hear some of those guys. And you know what? I, I'm hearing things I've heard all my life. But I'm hearing guys get up, and they're talking. And you know what? The Holy Ghost is on them, and they're full of the Holy Ghost. 
and uh, and they're fired up, and I'm just sitting there, and uh, and it just does me good to hear it again. Do, do I need some of those things? No, no. Now I need some things. I need some things, and I always will. But some of those things I hear, I don't need it, and yet it encourages me not to lose what I have. I want to encourage you this year. When you walk into the house of God, say, Lord, speak to me. Lord, it may be something I've heard a hundred times. Did you ever notice, uh, we were talking about this today, people that get saved, often they, 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 don't, get, they don't get saved the first time. They've heard it, heard it, heard it. Man, one day the lights come on. God will speak to you. When you open your Bible, don't, don't, just, don't just say, oh, yeah, I got to do my devotions real quick this morning. Yeah, 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 read it, read it, read it, and just be done. And you, you, ought, to, you ought to just, as often as you remember, and you ought to approach the book like this. Yo, open your Bible in the morning or in the evening or whenever you read, and you ought to say, Lord, Speak to me. I'm reading through the Bible again, and I'm in the book of um, the Judges right now. And I'm reading stories. And, and the other morning I was reading, and it, boy, it triggered a thought. And I wound up looking up something in Jeremiah. And it's all stuff. You guys know this. You've been saved a while. Some of the stories you've read, you've read, and you've read. And yet, it just, it just, you see something again. I just want to encourage you tonight. Um, you might be doing fine with whatever it is. But God wants you to hear it again. God wants you to read it again. Um, even though you don't need it. God has more to say and more to give. And he wants you to keep the ground you've gained. Let's pray. Lord, bless this simple truth. Lord, would you help us to always have our ears open to you? Even though we're not guilty of that thing. Even though something says all oh, that message is for somebody else. Lord, even though we think we don't need it. Lord, perhaps you're going to speak to us again. <clears throat> Lord, help us. Lord, I thank you for the people that are here tonight. Lord, they came. And Lord, I know that not everybody could come. And, and Lord, there's some people that are out there quite a distance. And, and Lord, it's just a blessing that they come when they can. Lord, whoever they are that is watching, hearing, listening to this, I pray, Lord, that you would encourage them, Lord, to um, just keep reading their Bible. Just keep listening to the truth. And Lord, to realize it is your way that you speak to people about things that they don't need. And Lord, may we embrace all your word at all times. Lord, that we lose not those things, that no man take our crown. Lord, may we see your hand in the repetition of, though we be established in the present truth. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed. If God spoke to you in some way, why don't you take a minute and talk to him?